Hello, everyone. Welcome back to St. Louis Teens, and welcome back to our series on Voices of Peace and Justice from Ferguson to Minneapolis. Today, we have with us Sarah K. Peck, an author, speaker, and startup advisor. She is the founder of Startup Pregnant, a media company documenting untold stories of women in leadership. So, Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what inspired you to become a consultant? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, I was born in Germany. I grew up in California. Uh, I now write a lot on the internet. I am working on a book and I live, now I live in New York City with my husband and two little boys. They're one and a half and four years old. I'm trying to think what inspired me to become a consultant. I don't know. I, you know, I, I have this uncharted path in entrepreneurship and I find that other entrepreneurs understand, but I, I'd actually be curious what you think, because for me, when I look at the world of work, it, it's just not clear all the time what jobs to get, or even if the jobs that are available now will be available in five years or 10 years. So I started out working in uh, architecture and landscape architecture, looking at the design of cities, looking at how we build the world that we live in. And uh, from there, and when I was working, it was 2008, right around when Facebook and social media was really taking off. And so I ended up helping companies figure out how to use social media to get better at business. And it was a long and winding path as I discovered that people really wanted to learn how to write on the internet, how to talk about yourself online, how to connect, how to build communities, um, how to use social media as part of business. This probably seems like a no brainer to you, I imagine, because you've grown up with this in your world. But when I was growing up, um, we had pagers in high school. So <laughs> we had beepers. Like I remember my junior year of high school, we had a beeper. Um, and then I got a cell phone and like a desktop Apple computer in college. And my last year of college is when Facebook started. So it's been a wild transition. And there's still so much that like tried and true businesses are learning about how to do this kind of work. So I identify as a writer and then I, I teach and I speak on the intersection of entrepreneurship and parenting. And could you share with us your favorite part about the work that you do? Oh, you know, I get so inspired when I talk to parents, especially mothers, but also like dads and co-parents and non-traditional parents, like whatever the new family looks like. I get so inspired when I talk to different people because there's, there's kind of the dominant voice in any culture about what something is supposed to look like. Like when you think of, oh, you know, this is, you know, women are supposed to become mothers or mothers are supposed to look like this or everyone's supposed to love having children. I mean, no, children are sometimes a pain in the butt. They're really, <laughs> they're a lot of work. And, and I just really like talking to people and telling the truth, telling uh, your truth, whatever that looks like. And there's no way we can all be the same. Uh, some people may absolutely adore babies and other people may think they're just boring poop factories. Some people may absolutely love five-year-olds and other people like may thrive at the middle school level. So I just love talking to parents about what their real experience is like, what they wish would change, what they wish more people understood. And I get to, I have a podcast. Uh, I have two, I have three podcasts now. I get to talk to people every week and I love having conversations. I'm so thankful that you brought me here to chat with you. Um, it just, it feels like, it feels like a really lucky thing and surreal that this is part of my job. And during these difficult times of racial unrest, we have seen our community come together in several different ways. And we really appreciate you taking the lead and first of all, talking about the problem and writing this really powerful article, which talks to the millions of Americans who have good intentions to help, but are you know rather unsure of what they can be doing. So what motivated you to write this article? You know, this is, there's a lot happening in America right now. So we're recording this June, 2020. There's a, like, it is incredible to watch all 50 states have people that are rising up to protest against centuries long injustice. Uh, 
we have so much work to do when it comes to fighting for equality and justice. And I lend my voice when I think that it will help influence someone or inspire someone to think a little bit differently. I really love talking about things that um, don't seem obvious yet to some people where I can maybe explain it in a story that helps them understand something. But this is not new, right? This is, right. This is not something that just started a month ago. This is something that is you know, for better, for worse, for worse, part of our history, but also it's going to take our entire lifetime to solve. And we have so much work to do. So, and I say we, you know, as a white person, um, but I mean white people, like uh, white people have a lot of work to do to figure out racial, uh, inequity and racism and becoming anti-racists and doing the work to show up better and to break down the systemic and institutionalized racism, racism that exists everywhere. And if you're watching this and you've never heard of this and you're like, wait, what is Sarah talking about? Like, why does she say it still exists? I haven't ever heard of this. Like, there are so many good books out there. Read one, two, or three of them and just open your eyes and be willing to be a little bit uncomfortable because there is a lot going on that we aren't necessarily taught in schools that we need to become aware of. And, you know, talking about, as a community, sort of breaking down these institutionalized racism um, or the existence of them, uh, I think the first step that you had said was acknowledging that there is racism. Yes. And you talk in your, you talk about your own research on Twitter and how who we follow and listen to can influence our narrative. So, and can you tell us a little bit more about that research and how did you stumble across that? You know, I, I thought it was a very interesting question. The, the question on Twitter or the, the, that it exists within us, which part? Oh, the, the question on Twitter. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of good things in here that I think are are interesting. The first is if you go to Harvard has this this um, test. It's called the implicit bias test, and you can go there and you can t uh, you go through a number of multiple choice questions, and they ask you, okay, pair. Um, it's like pair a word with a response, and what you have to do is just like you're playing a video game. You just tap the response, and you will see in real time how your brain struggles to comprehend things that don't feel as familiar. So if they say, um, I'm trying to think of a good example, but things that are gendered like pink or um, like motherhood or caretaking, it'll be much easier to pair that with somebody that's female, but it'll be much harder to pair that with somebody that looks like or talks like a traditional man or the concept of what a male or a masculine person is. And so it's, you will see that your response times are delayed, that you like you hesitate and you can map it out scientifically to see how this unconscious bias lives inside your mind. It is uncomfortable. It's not great. Nobody wants to go take a test and be like, well, boy, there's racism inside of me. Um, but I think this is the first step that we need to take, which is to look inside and say, oh, my brain is doing things. My, I have been trained this way. The culture I am living in has taught me certain things that I now need to actively unlearn. So another way of thinking about it is like, I always get so surprised when people are like, well, I'm not a racist. And I'm like, that's not it. It's not about labeling whether or not you are or you aren't every single person. It's like if you were a fish inside of an ocean and you're like, I don't taste salt water. And you're like, that, you're in an ocean, right? Like the ocean is salty. So we're all inside of this system and it's up to all of us to see it, to talk about it and to work against it. Either we're working against it or we're participating in it. There's no neutrality. You don't get to just float by and say like, well, I'm a good person because I'm nice to people. No, it's here. It's part of everything. And you got to do the work to help figure out what, where does it live? Where are these hidden demons inside of my brain? What can I do to contribute to making our society better? Where is this happening at the community level around us? Where is this happening at the um, infrastructure or institutional level? Like why are so many more 
brown and black people getting put into prison? What's that about? Why is that happening? You know, where is that? Where is the system breaking down? And what can we do as individual citizens and as a community to change that? I didn't answer your second question. What was your second question? Uh, that was how you sort of stumbled upon your Twitter question and your Twitter finding. Yeah, so so I, you know, I, it's been about four years now that I've been starting to track what I read. I remember I was reading a book um, and I was like, there are no women in this book. Like this book has, it had something like 250 sources in it and I kept flagging, but every single reference was basically of a white male. And I was like, well, if I read a book by a white male that then references only white men, like how many voices am I missing? And if every single author that I pick up does this, then my only reference points are gonna be more of exactly the same type of person. And I wasn't really comfortable with that. So I started tracking every book that I read. Um, I've done this, I'm now in my fourth year of tracking and I have metrics, you can see them on my website, but I have metrics where I wanna read at least 50% books by women and at least 25% books by people of color. Now, the reason I picked those metrics is because I'm looking at population demographics in the United States and I try to replicate it. There's no, like, there's not a right answer. You can say, I want a third, I want half, whatever it is for you. But I think the country has about 17% um, uh, Black Americans. And then I don't know the actual number for Hispanic or Asian, but I, I try to hit kind of around the same percentage just so that my voices are representative of the population in the country that I live in. Um, and I realized that if I didn't try, I would read 80% books by white men. If I just didn't pay attention, I would pick up a book and I'd be like, oh, that book, oh, I should read that book by Ben Horowitz. I should read that book by Cal Newport. Oh, I'm going to read this book by James Clear. And then all of a sudden I was reading all the same books and I wasn't actually getting new voices into my brain or exposing myself to new ideas. And I was like, oh, this is what people mean when they say systemic. This is what they mean when they say referral bias. And so I did that and I've now, I read about 50 books a year, so about one a week. I've done that for four years. You can see every book and all the breakdown. I even include the, um, the way that I calculate it and how I do the averages on my website. Just go to sarahkpeck.com slash books. And from there, I'm getting to your question. I know this is a very long answer, but there, I, then I went to Twitter and I was like, well, if I'm doing this on books, I've got to be doing it other places too. And I went through my Twitter and I said, who do I follow? And it was about a thousand people at the time. And I went through and I realized, same. It was exactly the same. I was following probably about 80% white men. Now, those of you listening, there's nothing wrong with white men necessarily. Maybe there is, who knows? Um, but like as a category, we don't say this is you know, bad about this group or that group. We can't make generalizations about massive groups of people. But as a demographic, if I'm only listening to voices that look like this, 80 to 90% of my listening, well, that's not, something's wrong. I need to be listening to more women. I need to be, like, women shouldn't be silent and people of color shouldn't be expected to be silent. Like, they, they and we have very interesting things to say. So I started unfollowing. I just went through the list and I was like, I'm gonna unfollow and I'm gonna start again and I'm gonna start following a whole bunch of new people, this time with intentionality, with the desire to actually listen to a group of people that looks like and sounds like the people I see around me in New York City and the people who actually live in this country. So that's a long answer to your question. But I think this is an example for people who are listening. If you think I'm not, like this, isn't, this doesn't apply to me. I don't, I, like, I'm not actively racist. I don't have bad intentions. That's not enough. You actually have to put intention and action into what you're doing. And that can be in doing something like looking at your Twitter. Who are you following? Looking at your Facebook. What does your friend group look like? Do you only have one person of color that's in your friend group? That's a problem, right? Look at your podcast player. Are you listening to all one type of person? You know, just start to go out and do the work of branching out and listening to new voices. You'll get so many good new ideas. You'll be exposed to things that you maybe don't normally stumble across in your average car trip to your local Starbucks or whatever you're doing. And 
I mean, it just, it makes us smarter. It makes us richer. It makes us kinder. It makes us more interesting as people. And it makes us have more compassion, I think, for other people as well, because we're no longer treating people as other groups, but as more of this like massive, interesting population of people that we have, at least in the United States, but also in the world. And I, I think that that perspective is something that's definitely very interesting and important. I know that, you know, I personally um, can say that I, I definitely never really saw it from that sort of perspective or put in that intention. But I think it's important that, you know, we all, you know, put in that intention right now and try our best to, you know, make sure we mimic our actual nation as it is. Uh, I, I did want to sort of go back to something that you had mentioned earlier about, you know, talking about the one, or the very first thing you had mentioned on this topic was, you know, the books that you were reading and the mm -hmm. authors. Uh, I, I know it can be difficult, but if you had to pick one book um, as your favorite book that has sort of moved you the most, which one would you pick? It's such a hard question. I, and I know I should, I should have like thought of something in advance because I, I don't know. I love books and books. I feel like books speak to you at different times in your life. Sometimes I've had a favorite book and then I go back to read it and it doesn't do the same thing for me because I'm a different person later on. Um, but one of my, there's so many, but uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl is a really powerful book um, about uh, the tenacity of the human spirit. And um, Pema Chodron's book called uh, When Things Fall Apart or When Things Are Absolutely Wretched and It Feels Like Everything Is Crumbling Down. Those are two books that have been really, really important to me um, personally because, I mean, I'm just going to assume that everybody watching this is a human, right? We're human and we experience sorrow and pain and sadness and loss, like whether it's somebody close to us that's dying or a dream that's taken away or a, something we've poured our energy and effort into that doesn't work or the unfairness of so many things and the cruelty that can be out there. It's really hard to find out who you are and how to get through it. So those two books have, have meant a lot to me as I go through this, this life. And you do talk a lot about having a comfortable conversation about racism and that that is also something that's really important. I think that, you know, it's true that for a lot of people, it, it can be uncomfortable to bring up that conversation and to talk about that topic. Uh, so how do you think people can best learn the process of at least attempting to have a comfortable conversation about it? So this is a really interesting question. And I, I, I think like, let's compare it to going to the gym. Um, do you work out, by the way? Do you like working out? Um, um, yeah, I, I think it's sort of on the line there. I, I, <laughs> I'll be honest, I'm not exactly, I don't usually go to the gym very often, but you know, before okay. sort of sports season, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so like, uh, the thing for me is like, when we go to the gym, I don't think anybody goes there being like, hey, I want to feel so good. Like we go to the couch to feel good. We go to the couch, we eat chips and we watch TV. Why? To feel comfortable. Um, but when we go to the gym to lift weights, we're not going there being like, yeah, I really hope these weights make me feel super comfortable. Like we go there because the weights are going to stretch us. They're actually going to create micro tears in our muscles and they're going to help us grow. And we are going to get stronger because of it. And we may even experience uh, pleasant feelings afterwards, but I don't think many people during the weightlifting session are like, this is amazing. I love this feeling. So I think the same is true <laughs> during com difficult conversations. Like there can be deep satisfaction from having difficult conversations and you can really grow and stretch yourself as a person. But I don't think the objective is to be comfortable. The point of having conversations about race and racism and social justice is to achieve social justice and equity, is to dismantle these horrible systems that are killing people on a daily basis. People are dying. Black bodies and brown bodies are suffering, and Asian bodies, and so many different people are dying. 
because of racist policies and programs in our country and because of the unconscious beliefs that we all have. So the goal is not for me to feel good, right, as a white person entering into this conversation. And it's definitely not about me being comfortable. And it has nothing to do really with my feelings. And me being uncomfortable is like the bare minimum requirement for having these conversations. And if I'm not comfortable being uncomfortable, then that's actually known as white fragility in a way. It's when people are like, ooh, this is too scary. I don't wanna have this conversation. To which I say, we are all humans and adults and having hard conversations is part of what we need to learn how to do in this world. Um, and put your own comfort aside. Recognize that you may be going to the gym. If you feel super uncomfortable, um, just breathe breathe, wait, don't try to blurt it out. Don't try to like fix it right away. Just say what you are. I'm uncomfortable. Say it in your mind. I don't feel great about this. This doesn't feel good. And acknowledge that the person who may be talking to you on the other side may have a lot more pain than your discomfort. That's my two cents. And what are some of the more direct actions that individuals or corporations can take to help and be a part of the solution, as you say, um, you know, making sure that even though it's uncomfortable, you go, you have those conversations in order to be a part of the solution and sort of, and try to end the institutionalized racism that has plagued this country for many, many centuries. You know, this is an interesting question because I, I think, I think the first thing to know is that there isn't a playbook. There isn't like a 10 step ebook that you can download and be like, and now we're going to end racism by the end of July. Like that we don't have that manual. We don't have that book. Um, I mean, we do have really good resources by people far smarter than me and more informed on this. I'm not an expert on this subject. I am a conversationalist who likes writing, who happens to be passionate about this as well. But um, there's a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist that's amazing. There's a book called So You Want to Talk About Race, which is amazing. Like go read read these books, first of all, but direct actions. Like, I think first, no, there's no playbook. There's, you, there isn't a right way to do this. So you're, by definition, you're then going to get some of it wrong. You're going to try and it's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to get some of it wrong, but know that getting some of it wrong and being uncomfortable is more important than doing nothing because doing nothing is perpetuating the systems that exist. So once you realize the systems that exist are actively oppressing people and that you are complicit, neutrality is not an option. You are either allowing things to continue by which you are perpetuating things that you say you don't believe in, or you're actively working against it. So taking action is important. What kind of action can you take? Read books, host conversations. Um, ask for and demand new policies in your schools if you see something that's not right. Go to your local town halls. Uh, talk to your local police stations or make sure to vote. Voting is so, 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 so important, especially voting at the local level. It's not just the presidential election or the Senate or the House that matter, but it's also your local elections that are so important. Figure out who is on the judicial committee? Who are the mayors? Who are the people that are creating the system? Have they been in power for a really long time? Have they done things that you agree with? If you disagree with them, get out the vote and don't just vote yourself, but register other people to vote and make a commitment in a group of five or 10 people that you all are going to vote in all of these elections. That would be the first step. If you want to go beyond that, there are some wonderful organizations that, um, like it, people may not have a lot of money to donate. I like to donate money because it helps and I have small children at home, so it helps me help other people. But if you don't have a lot of money, but you do have time, you can do things like get out the vote. Uh, I think crooked.com and, oh, what's the website? Crooked.com has something like I think it's called adopt a state. You'll have to look it up, but you can adopt a state in this upcoming election and you can campaign in Florida or Arizona or Wisconsin. If you live in a state that isn't a battle, isn't a battleground state. Like I live in New York city. We're a pretty blue state. Like if you live in another state and you're purple or you think that there's a local election or an upcoming election that's important to you, go work on it. It's, this is how you have, this is one of the ways where you can have your voice heard. 
And, you know, talking about what people can do, what would your message be for teens around the nation during this time? Yeah. I mean, I want to ask you, what's it like to be a teenager right now? Uh, I, 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 I would say it's definitely uh, a very interesting time. I think, you know, it's been a series of sort of large changes to our nation as a whole um, uh, throughout the entirety of the year. I think that there's a lot of teens who right now feel they want to do something um, and they want to do something about this problem. And I know that I have felt like that as well. Um, but it's not always the easiest to try and figure out, you know, what should I be doing? And I think that the disconnection there is where a lot of teens are right now. Yeah. And, and you're maybe not even quite at voting, right? You voted 18? Yeah. So I can't vote yet. Uh, yeah. But there are graduating seniors at my school who are eligible to vote. Yes. So the thing to remember too is that like just because you can't vote yet um, doesn't mean that you can't influence the vote. So one of the biggest things that affects our democracy is that people forget or they don't know how to register. Like voter registration is hugely important and hugely overlooked, but Let's say that there is a senior citizen community close to you, or there are groups of people who um, can't actually leave their jobs to go vote. Getting them signed up to be able to vote absentee ballot by mail, it takes a form. So if you can get savvy on the internet and you can walk around your neighborhood and you can participate and get out the vote, you as a 15, 16, or 17 year old can still contribute 10, 20, 30, 100 votes in an election, even if you personally can't vote yet. Sarah, thank you so much for not only taking the initiative to educate our community and to propose solutions, uh, but we also thank you for your service and your time. You'll be able to access Sarah's full article on racism in America by clicking the link in the description below. And finally, thank you, Sarah, uh, once again for your time and answering all of our questions today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Feel free to reach out if you have any more questions also.